Thank you all for taking some time to uh, join us today. Uh, my name is James Bogart, CEO and President of Bogart Wealth. Uh, it's been a little while since I've done one of these guys. I've been doing the webinars uh, for the last couple of months. Um, before we get started, uh, we are recording this. So if, if you happen to miss it or if you want to share it with a friend or colleague, uh, we'll have the link uh, published up on our website here soon. I also have the chat box and question and answer box open. So please feel free to ask questions. Uh, no bad questions at all. But a uh, real quick introduction on Bogart Wealth. So Bogart Wealth is what's called a registered investment advisory firm. We're managing about $1.6 billion of client assets. It's about 850 households. 90% of those are uh, ExxonMobil employees. We are true fiduciaries for our clients, it means that we're legally obligated to put your interest above our own. Uh, no hidden agendas, no conflicts of interest. You know, I really have done a good job of wanting to set the firm up the way that I'd want to be done for my family. We have now 21 folks on our wealth management and planning team. We've got four as part of our tax team. We've got three different office locations, one in McLean, Virginia, one in Houston, Texas, as well as one in the Woodlands, Texas. Our mission is to help our clients achieve financial peace of mind by preserving and maximizing intergenerational wealth. You know, I always emphasize the intergenerational part of our mission statement. Uh, we do know the impact that your kids or your parents can have on anyone's financial plan. Um, we've made it part of our firm's culture to give your children access to certified financial planners, uh, mostly because you know the earlier we can get started, the better off we're going to end up being. Um, and then one of the calls to actions from any of, of the events that we do is to offer an absolutely no cost, absolutely no obligation, uh, free financial planning session. Uh, part of the follow up from the events, uh, one of the team members will reach out to, to see if you're interested. But uh, it really does allow you to have that baseline to see where your things are at. And, and then ultimately, we can discuss different ways of, of enhancing and improving. You know, there is no too early either. So feel free. Um, and then today's talk is part of our retirement readiness series. So we do actually several events uh, geared towards different topics, things that we're being asked, uh, but we have one on the retirement planning timeline, one on retirement income planning, one on social security and social security strategies, one on tax planning as well as tax law changes. So uh, we've been waiting to hear more on that one uh, before we do it again. Uh, we're gonna do one on estate planning strategies, one on net unrealized appreciation and post-retirement income strategies, one on long-term care and long-term care insurance, uh, one on Ross for traditional 401ks and IRAs. And then we actually also have one that we do on mega backdoor Roth and Roth conversions. We'll talk a little bit about that today as well. All right, so, so diving in, um, you know, kind of three key sections I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the basics. Uh, we're going to talk about some, some general conclusions and then some special situations around traditional 401ks as well as traditional IRAs. So just diving in a little bit. So when we talk about this, we're going to get into the nature of what is an IRA and 401k versus what is a Roth IRA or Roth 401k, and then some of the differences between savings. Um, so for example, an IRA is where you put money in on a before-tax basis. Uh, this is the same for a traditional 401k. It grows completely tax-deferred, and then you pay ordinary income out when you take money out of a traditional IRA or a 401k. Um, IRAs and 401ks have different contribution limits. I'll summarize those in a few minutes. But uh, the other thing with IRAs um, and 401ks is they have what are called required minimum distributions. Uh, RMDs is the acronym you'll hear us talk about. And we're going to talk about some of the impact there and why it's important to do some of this advanced planning ahead of when that becomes the time frame when we need to start taking money out of retirement accounts. Now, we compare traditional IRAs and 401ks to Roth IRAs and 401ks. Now, with Roth IRAs and 401ks, this is where we put money in on an after-tax basis. It grows completely tax-free. And as long as it's been in the account for over five years and you're over the age of 59 and a half, the money can be taken out completely tax-free. So there's a lot of, uh, and I should also add, Roth IRAs do not have required minimum distributions. Roth 401ks do have required minimum distributions. So required minimum distributions start when you turn the age of 72. Um, so a lot of times what we're, what we're pushing for is anybody who has Roth 401k, we wanna make sure that we roll Roth 401k money out into a Roth IRA 
so we're not being forced to take some money out. Um, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into this a uh, little bit later in the presentation. But to kind of illustrate why this planning has a lot of misconceptions around it and, and why we need to talk about sequencing of savings and also sequencing of cash flows, uh, we use a real quick example to, to try to demonstrate some of these points. So let's just assume you're married and each of you earns uh, $80,000 a year, $160,000 total. We'll know that your marginal tax rate is 22%. Now, you have $20,000 to fund between your combined incomes this year. With the traditional 401k, if, if you put $20,000 in, it actually is going to drop your taxable income down to $140,000 combined. With a Roth, that means that you're going to actually have the ability to save $15,600 because you have to do, you have to pay taxes first, which is about $4,400. Now, after 30 years, uh, it's just assuming an 8% return. Uh, the traditional IRA, it looks to be 2.265 million versus the Roth IRA is 1.767 million. Now, it's important to note that with traditional 401ks, because it's pre-tax savings, you're saving that at the highest marginal bracket. So dependent upon your tax situation, for example, if you're a high income earner, well, we're definitely going to want to make sure that we're doing pre-tax savings as opposed to Roth. Now, you'll look at these numbers, the 2.265 versus the 1.767, and naturally you'd assume, well, the traditional is bigger than the Roth. Well, it's important to remember, traditional still has to pay tax, the Roth does not. So to build on this, let's just assume after 30 years, again, uh, same numbers, 2.265 versus the Roth at 1.767. So let's just then assume that you are going to take 6% out for withdrawals. So for the traditional, it's $164,598 a year. The Roth would be $128,386 per year. Now, if you have to pay tax on the traditional, it would appear that those numbers are identical, right? So the traditional after taxes would be $128,386 and the Roth also $128,386. So if the tax rates are exactly the same, there is no difference between Roth versus traditional. However, that's not always the case. Um, is your tax bill really going to be exactly 22% in retirement? Well, if your retirement income is $164,598, meaning that is the taxable amount of the distributions, well, your marginal tax rate will be 22%. But it's important to remember that because of the progressive nature of the U.S. tax structure, meaning the first 10 percent is at up to a certain level, then the next uh, uh, 12 percent is at the next level, then 22, then 24, then 32, then 35, then 37. Well, your effective tax rate is always lower than your marginal tax rate. Effective tax rate meaning what you actually pay. So if your marginal tax rate's at 22 percent, then your average is actually going to be 17.1, which means that the net amount of what you're taking out of the IRA is actually going to be $136,452, uh, 82.9% of the original $164,598. Now, it's going to take tax rates going up by 34% for the Roth to break even here in this analysis. So the point really is, is that if your taxes are lower in retirement while you're working, you really should be saving in the traditional 401k. And here's kind of a nice little chart that summarizes this a little bit. We've got average tax rate along the top, and then we've got marginal tax rates along the, the side here. And the point is, is that back to what I had said earlier, if the tax rates are exactly the same in retirement as to what your marginal tax rates are now, then it's a complete push. But if your average tax rate after retirement is lower than your marginal tax rate now, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to favor traditional 401ks. Now, you might be in a situation, though, where your tax rate in retirement is actually going to be higher than what you're paying now. And if that's the case, then we really want to make sure that we're maxing out the Roth 401ks. And a lot of times we see that, by the way, with younger employees, with younger employees, as much as it might, the, the, the uh, propensity or desire is to save more on a pre-tax basis. Well, it's 
most likely the case that they're in a, in a lower tax bracket now, especially early on in their career, than whether they're going to be closer and closer to retirement, where hopefully you know, career success and progression, they're making more money. Uh, but to kind of reemphasize that point that I made before, the progressive tax brackets favor traditional 401k, especially if you're in the later years of your working career. Um, and it's important to remember that all contributions are going in at that highest marginal bracket. So back to that example I used a moment ago, we made 160, we save at 20,000, it brings our taxable income down to 140. Um, and then your withdrawals, what you're taking the money out at is being taxed at your average tax rate. All right, so to kind of flesh this out a little bit more, uh, 401ks, you have the ability to put $19,500 in for 2021. That's actually the same as what it was in 2020. It's up slightly from 2019 or 2018. Um, you also have the ability to do $6,500 of catch-up contributions if you are over the age of 50. So a total of $26,000 if you're over the age of 50. Um, you, there are no income limits if you want to do a Roth contribution, uh, excuse me, a Roth 401k contributions. However, it's important to know that you have a choice. You can do 26,000 pre-tax or 26,000 Roth, uh, uh, Roth 401k contributions. It's not both. So you're making a sacrifice if you want to do the pre-tax. In, in lieu of Roth or Roth, you're giving up some of your pre-tax. Now for IRAs, as well as Roth IRAs, you can do $6,000 contributions if you're uh, in 2021, which is the same as what it was in 2020 and 2019. If you're over the age of 50, you get to do an additional $1,000 of catch up. Now, in order to do contributions for um, Roths, if you're individual, your tax, your tax, uh, taxable income must be below 139,000. For married couples, it's uh, for 2021. It's actually 208,000. With that slight typo, I'll fix that on here. Um, you can contribute to both the Roth and traditional, but the total is going to be limited to the 6,000 if you're under the age of 50 or 7,000 if you're over the age of 50. You also can contribute to both a 401k and an IRA, but you're not going to be eligible to take advantage of a deduction for the IRA if you're actively participating in a 401k. Um, now, 401ks typically are where we prefer to save uh, because of the higher contribution limits. Uh, and also, normally, there's 401k matches within there. If you're an ExxonMobil employee, we know that that's suspended. I don't anticipate that will last forever. Um, but ultimately, we still would favor max out your 401k first, then come back and look at doing traditional IRA savings if you have the ability to do more. Now, um, early withdrawal penalties. Uh, this is something that we want to talk about with regards to sequencing and determining cash flows. So IRAs have a penalty for withdrawing prior to the age of 59 and a half. Um, if you're under 59 and a half, it's a 10% penalty. There are a few exceptions. Um, education. Uh, there's a tax provision called 72T, which is where we can turn on a five-year annuity of an IRA account to then have five exactly equal payments. It avoids penalties, still pays ordinary income. We can take money out directly for medical expenses. And there's also a provision for first-time home purchases. If you've not owned a home in the last two years, you're considered a first-time home buyer. You can take up to 10000 out, penalty-free, still pay ordinary income. Um, now, Ross, you can do contributions and conversions penalty-free after five years. Now, 401ks uh, are very similar. There is still a penalty for withdrawal prior to the age of 59 and a half. Um, it's the exact same 10% penalty. The exceptions, though, there's a new one in here. If you're over 55 and separated from service from your company, you have the ability to take money out once a year penalty-free, still paying ordinary income, and the Roth's exactly the same as before. But really, the reason we want to understand this, is, understand this is, is around cash flows and sequencing and modeling cash flows dependent upon the age at which you're retiring. Now, required minimum distributions. This is something I had talked a little bit about uh, kind of at the beginning, but again, these are when you are 72, you are forced to start taking out a percentage of your retirement accounts every single year. 
You can obviously do more than that, but this is the minimum required amount. Now, if you miss anything, there is a 50% penalty. Yes, five zero, big penalty. Now, requ uh, required minimum distributions apply to any traditional IRA. They apply to traditional 401ks. They also apply to Roth 401ks. Required minimum distributions do not apply to Roth IRAs. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a Roth 401k, typically by the time you could turn the age of 72, we want to make sure we move it over to a Roth IRA. Now, just to give an example, um, there's actually a proposal that's in place to adjust required minimum distribution percentages. The uh, proposal, which is most likely going to get passed, is at age 72, you're going to be having to take out, oh, excuse me, uh, at age 72, you're going to have to be taking out 3.7% of your accounts. And that percentage increases every single year that if you're fortunate enough to live to age 120, you're taking out 50% that year. Um, for most of our clients, though, when they get into their 80s, it's when it's these years, the five to call it 8% years, that it's when it really becomes a requirement of distributions are getting very, very punitive. Um, and what I mean by punitive is if you're forced to take out more money than you would like to live off of, and ultimately it's causing your tax brackets to go higher and higher and higher. So general conclusions, you know, we want to understand the differences between 401ks and IRAs. We want to understand what factors would favor Roth versus traditional 401ks. And everyone's situation is going to be very, very different. This is where having a firm like Bogart Wealth come look at your situation and help you determine where it's appropriate to save, how to save, when to save. Um, it's absolutely uh, an added value to you. Now, employee, uh, use your 401k before considering a separate IRA. Now, uh, reasons for that is you have the employer match, usually, if you're an Exxon Mobil employee, they have higher contribution limits, and you have potential for other tax strategies, uh, such as net unrealized depreciation. We have a whole separate presentation on, on NUA and what that is, uh, but it's something that we want to bring into the consideration. Now, factors that will favor the Roth 401k. If income tax rates are going to be higher when you retire than they are now, you'll want to do a Roth 401k. If you expect your salary and spending to go up significantly faster than inflation between now and retirement, do Roth now and switch to a traditional later. That's kind of the situation when I talk about younger employees. Um, if income tax rates all go up in the future, well, in new administration, that's a possible scenario. We might want to look at it, but it's one variable that needs to be brought into consideration. If you are going to be in the situation of what we call RMD prison or, or have um, excess required minimum distributions, means that you're going to pay more tax relative to what your required living expenses are, then Roth will help reduce that pain. And then lastly, if you plan on having a legacy for your family, well, we want to see all of that money transition to the next generation tax-free as well, we would recommend the Roth. Now, factors that would favor a traditional 401k. If income taxes will be lower in retirement than now, and again, it's important to remember marginal tax rates, even if we see all tax rates go up, but if your marginal effective tax rate, excuse me, your effective tax rates lower than your marginal tax rate, still factor that into the analysis. Um, and as I mentioned before, the progressive nature of our tax brackets favors traditional, means all of your contributions go in at that highest marginal bracket. Um, any other types of future tax law changes that might impact this? So for example, a flat tax uh, might mean a lower rate overall, a national consumption tax like a VAT tax that would also favor traditional over a Roth. Now, if you anticipate that you're going to be living on pretty much all of your assets or drawing down retirement accounts, that would also favor um, doing uh, traditional because you're not going to have required minimum distributions issues uh, later on in life. And then if you're also in the position where you want to leave a legacy to charity, that would favor traditional because when uh, assets transfer from retirement accounts to charities, charities won't pay taxes off of that. So again, bigger picture conversation, but it would still favor traditional. Now, there are some special circumstances that go into this, and we're going to dive into each of these a little bit more specifically. Um, excess required minimum distributions, we're going to talk about 529s versus IRA accounts, savings outside of the 401k, and then any inherited IRAs.
But, you know, if you live long enough, you're going to have one or two outcomes. Either you are going to deplete your IRA or your required minimum distributions are going to be larger than your living expenses. We call that uh, surplus RMDs or, or categorically RMD prison. Now, for most people, it's going to take a really large RMD surplus to move average tax rates to, to surpass their marginal. However, it, it is something that we do see, um, especially those that are uh, big savers and have large after-tax accounts. So if you have large uh, surplus required minimum distributions, this is where you might want to either consider Roth 401k now or consider a Roth IRA or conversions now, or more specifically, consider uh, IRA conversions after you've retired when you're in a lower tax rate, but before you turn to age 72. This is typically the best option and probably the best planning strategy to be considering. And then lastly is consider gifting, fund a Roth IRA for any of your working kids. Uh, that's something to be you know, considering in the overall planning strategy as well. Now, keep in mind, there is that five-year rule in order to materialize full tax benefits. So for contributions, Roth IRA must be in existence for five years or more. For conversions, the conversion um, must have been made five years ago or longer. So just factor that into some of the analysis. When we do a conversion to a Roth, we want to get it started. That five-year clock is, is pretty important. Have that Roth be open for some time before we start thinking about taking it out. All right. So this is kind of what we describe as our Roth conversion tree. And this is first thing we look at is tax bracket. Do you think that you're going to be in the same or higher tax bracket when you retire? Well, if the answer is no, then converting to a Roth IRA might not make sense if the conversion is going to be greater than future tax rates. If the answer is yes, then we want to start looking at what the timeline is of when we expect to be taking withdrawals. If, if we're going to be, uh, the time horizon's not long at all, then we shouldn't really even worry about conversions. But if it's going to be some time, then we need to factor in, do we have to pay tax? Do we have money to pay taxes off of these conversions? And if the answer is no, and we're going to create more taxable income to try to pay the tax bill, conversions themselves might not make sense. But if the answer is yes, then we really do want to be looking at Roth conversions. And so this is where some of the Roth conversion, pl conversion planning becomes so impactful. Um, and it really needs to be integrated into someone's overall financial plan. And so this is just an example of a client situation where they had a, an expensive retirement year, but then they quickly dropped into lower taxable brackets because they've got some after-tax money to live off of. But then they're very quickly going to be rising up where as soon as they turn 72, they go right into the 33% bracket. And then in later years of life, because that required minimum distribution percentage is increasing year over year, well, that's ultimately going to push them up into higher brackets as well. Now, and you can kind of see from this chart here, marginal brackets dip down, then they get higher and higher and higher. Now, this is a situation where, it, you know, it's a very fortunate household. They've got some after-tax assets, they've got IRAs, but nothing that's in that Roth category really uh, but ultimately projected at end of life to leave their kids about 13 million bucks. Now, what's interesting is if just by looking at some strategy work where we'll do some conversions in the years where we're in lower tax brackets means we're going to pay tax now. So this is, again, an example of $700,000 of conversions that are done over four years. Well, now all of a sudden, They've actually increased their total portfolio assets, but the amount of money that they're leaving to their kids tax-free is actually pretty darn significant. Um, and it's important to talk about this. This is an illustration. The way that Bogart Wealth works with their clients is every year we are building out tax performance. We're going to execute conversions based upon what your taxable income is and model out different scenarios and then show how it has long-term impact on someone's portfolio. But really why we're doing this is looking at two, two aspects of this. How can we decrease the required minimum distributions? So again, this example is showing a decrease of about 1.688 million of lifetime RMDs. And more specifically, how much money are we saving in taxes? Because we're doing conversions, we're making the decision to pay more in taxes in earlier years in order to reduce the tail, if you will. So this is a projected tax savings of about 518,000. Now, it's important to probably emphasize the material savings occurs in later years. I understand that. 
we don't ever know how long someone's going to live. We need to obviously operate and work under the assumption that you're going to live a little while. But most of that material tax savings happens on later on in life. That's a perpetual debate that I end up having with clients. Now, we also want to understand what is the impact on effective tax rates. And again, same thing. We're making the decision to pay tax now in order to reduce effective tax rate lifetime. Um, so one example, part of our planning work, by the way, is to run through optimization scenarios like this um, to help illustrate some of the value of, of why we would, would want to consider some of these strategies. All right. A couple of questions we get just kind of get into this, some of this surplus data. You know, people ask the question of should I save in a 529 or should I save in a Roth IRA for education expenses? Um, so a 529 is a college savings vehicle. Um, it has a lot of advantages. There's no income limit on contributions. There's no tax on withdrawals for qualified education expenses. And there are annual contribution limitations are significantly higher than a Roth IRA. You can actually do $15,000 per husband, per wife, per beneficiary, so $30,000 a year. And with Roth, you actually have, I'm sorry, with Roth, with 529s, you have the ability to front load five years of, of contributions all at once. So you can theoretically put $150,000 into a 529 all in one year. And then five years later, you can go and do the exact same thing all over again. Now, there are some limitations, uh, and, and these are ones to be very mindful of. The first is uh, there are taxes and penalties if the expenses are not for qualified education expenses. And 529s are also considered assets on uh, FAFSA form, student aid applications. So a lot of times for our clients, it's grandpa and grandma are thinking about doing this for their grandkids. I think it's really important from a planning perspective, do it at your, you are the one that's setting it up for your grandchildren, as opposed to giving your money to your kids and giving your money, the, the kids, the kids to put into the five to nine, especially if the kids are going to be in the fortunate position that they are uh, potentially going to qualify for financial aid. Um, typically, I do recommend let's fund the 529 first, but let's not overfund. And then let's look at doing Roth contributions or conversions that can be withdrawn tax and penalty free for qualified education expenses. Um, and this is where it's also important to note that IRAs are not disclosed on student financial aid applications. So want to make sure that we use that potentially can help supplement some of these things. Um, I had a question come in. I want to make sure I got, is there some sort of special treatment you can do to convert a Roth IRA when you are taking all of the money out of VOIA after retirement, like convert some or all or post-tax money to Roth? I thought I heard that somewhere. Um, yes, I have that coming up in a second. If you hold that, I'll come right back to it. And I've got some slides for it. All right. So savings with the 401k and then beyond 401k. So again, contribution limits, you have the ability to do 19,500 of contributions if you're under 50, uh, $6,500 of additional catch up. There is a maximum amount that you can put into a 401k of $58,000 a year. Again, if you're under 50, it's 64,500 if you're over the 50 because of that $6,500 catch up. Now, what we mean by this, you can do, and I'm gonna use an over 50 year old just to, to give the example, let's say 26,000 on a before tax basis. Now you have a total of 64,500 you can, you can put in there. That's $38,500 of additional money that can go in. Now, some of that will be from a company match. Now, as I mentioned, ExxonMobil suspended their match. So now the employees almost, you know, I try to find the lemonade out of the lemons. Obviously, to having the match go away, that's, that's essentially a, a pay cut. However, it gives us the ability to put 38500 into a 401k on an after-tax basis. Um, and this is what pre presents kind of what we call the mega backdoor Roth. It's also an opportunity to this exact question that's coming in to have after-tax money accumulate within the 401k, specifically annotated as your pre-87, post-86. And that money, when you retire, you have the ability to, to uh, either pull it out and use it for cash. You can have the ability to take it and send it over to a Roth IRA, or you can use it to offset NUA. Now, there's another strategy related to this, which is the mega backdoor Roth, which you can do while you're working. It's uh, called a tax paid withdrawal maximum allowable with no suspension that you can take some of that after tax money 
You have to then do a prorated calculation based on how much growth there is in that money. But it's something where you can actually take that 38,500 and if it hasn't grown at all, all of it can be rolled over to a Roth IRA um, from outside of the savings plan into a Roth IRA at a brokerage account outside of the firm. Happy to have that discussion and talk about your situation. And if it's gonna have an impact, um, please feel free to reach out. Now, contributions in excess of what we can do with the 401k. So we have the ability to do the IRA, as I mentioned, $6,000 if you're under 50, $1,000 of catch up. Um, we can do Roth conversions tax-free if there's no other IRA. It's what we call the backdoor Roth. So a minute ago, I just mentioned the mega backdoor. And we also have the ability to do the same thing with a IRA as well. So if you're over $57,000, we can put it into an IRA and immediately convert it over to a Roth if there is no traditional IRA account balances in there. Um, I kind of already hit these, but just to quickly summarize. So um, you can take a deduction if you um, are, if you're covered by a plan, your deduction limitations are 76,000 if you're single, if you're married, it's 125,000. If one spouse is covered by a plan, so typically we see this with the non-working spouses, um, they, it phases out at 208,000. Now, if you have no intention of taking a deduction off of a Roth an IRA contribution, excuse me, uh, there is no income limit. So you can do an IRA contribution no matter what your income threshold is. And also Roth IRAs. And unfortunately, there's only two ways of getting money into Roth IRAs. One is contributions, the other is conversions. Now, with a Roth IRA, you're, if you're single, your income threshold is 140000 before your, your AGI takes you out of eligibility to con, uh, do a contribution. And if you're married, it's 208000 After that, unfortunately, we have to look at other methods. And this is what then introduces Roth conversions. Now, Roth conversions, there is no income threshold. The limitation strictly is on how much you're willing to pay in taxes. So as I mentioned a moment ago, there is this opportunity to put after-tax money into a traditional IRA and then immediately convert it over to a Roth completely tax-free. It's awesome. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, another question came in. The numbers you're sharing is far more than what I am working with. Can you still work with me? <laughs> yes. Um, we were showing one situation. The, the numbers with regards to the conversions Absolutely. When we get into the planning work, it does not matter what your portfolio value is now. It's really the impact on your cash flows and spending in later years. And uh, <laughs> yes. All right. Inherited Roth IRAs. Now, we get this question a ton. As I mentioned earlier, if you plan on leaving a large legacy to your kids, then Roth IRAs are a great way of doing it. And, and that's partly kind of, I call it the, uh, the sweetener on any of these Roth conversion strategies we're talking about. But your Roth IRA has no IR, uh, required minimum distributions. It's important to note that inherited IRAs do have um, um, required minimum distributions. Now, if it's a spouse, there is no RMD requirement other than their own. Obviously with Roths, there is none for a spouse. But if it's a non-spouse, whether it's your kids or the trust, they have 10 years that they have to take the money out. So a lot of times when we're integrating kids planning, we start working with your kids and they've inherited money. The conversation we're having with them is what's traditional, what's Roth. Now, knowing that the Roth we have to take out over 10 years, then frankly, we're going to tell them, leave the Roth money alone. Let's get 10 more years of tax-free growth. We use the pre-tax money first. And so I've already kind of stolen the thunder on inherited traditional IRAs, but it's the same thing as the Ross, except for they have to pay taxes. So spousal beneficiaries, so if your spouse inherits, they can roll it to their own or they can treat it as an inherited IRA and start taking RMDs out based upon the, their, the, the other, the uh, decedent spouse who passed away over their lifetime. But for non-spousal beneficiaries, it's again, it's the same thing. Uh, and they have 10 years. So prior to 2019, there was something that allowed them to stretch it out over their lifetime. So if you've already inherited an IRA, well, of course, you still have the ability to stretch it out over your lifetime, assuming the person passed away before the end of 2019. They passed away in 2020 or later, then unfortunately, this new 10-year rule does kick in. 
But again, this is where planning becomes so important. Let us help integrate all of this into the overall strategy. There's a lot of factors that goes into a lot of this analysis. Um, I think it's extremely important. First and foremost, you have to have a plan and you need to integrate this strategy work into all of your planning. But you need to understand what your current marginal tax rate is versus future average tax rates and impacts related to sources of assets. So if you've got pre-tax money, if you've got after-tax money, what we expect required minimum distributions to do with regards to your living expense, expenses. We want to integrate it with all of our cash flow sources to include Social Security. We also want to integrate it to include any type of conversion work and what impact that's going to have to your Medicare premiums. But then we're going to want to factor in outside considerations such as tax law changes um, or estate planning or legacy concerns. So. As I said, it's important, have a plan. We do offer absolutely no cost, absolutely no obligation planning. Um, one of the, the team members will follow up after the presentation. If there's something you need, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, we are gonna have a brief survey at the end here. Um, if I didn't answer any questions or you didn't ask any questions that you'd like to have an answer to, here's all of our contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, and thank you again for taking some time to uh, join us this afternoon. Take care, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll talk more soon.